Hello there, and welcome back to a course in Cognitive Linguistics. In this episode, I'll talk about language and color, and that's going to be the first episode in a mini-series within the series on a big question, namely, does your language influence the way you think? Okay, right, uh, this question is uh, so big, I'm going to make it large. Right, um, so does language influence the way you think? You're probably thinking, what's up with that ice cream? Yeah. Actually, it's not about the ice cream. More important is what's on top of the ice cream. And to explain to you why that matters, let me teach you a little bit of German, which is my native language. So in German, the liquid stuff that you pour over ice cream is called Soße. Yeah, Soße. And Soße is basically anything that is liquid and that you can pour over other kinds of food, like salad or pork roast or spaghetti, of course. Yeah, all of that is called Soße. And if you're a native speaker of English, that might actually surprise you because in English there's a very similar word, sauce, which you know is stuff that you pour over spaghetti. By contrast, if you're having pulled pork or brisket, what you put on top is gravy. On salad you have dressing and on ice cream topping. Yeah. So from this it looks as though the Germans are simply more general and the English more particular, but if you look a little closer that's actually not the case. Yeah. Um, English has uh, the English word sauce can also refer to fruity sweet concoctions that are made from strawberries and rhubarb and uh, other sweet fruit and the Germans wouldn't call this Soße, they would call this Kompot. Yeah? Um, so that is kind of strange how now people have different ideas of what sauce is or, or Soße and uh, what you put under the heading of this word. Okay. What does all of this have to do with language and thought? Uh, words such as Soße or sauce are not just words, but they reflect a category, that is, a cognitive grouping that speakers of a language have made. So if two languages divide the thing in the world into different categories so that their respective terms overlap, but do not refer exactly to the same things, then this means that the speakers of the two languages have slightly different world views. Now, you might say, come on, world view, that's a term that is perhaps a little highbrow for, you know, compote and ice cream and sauce. But of course, uh, sauce is just one word. Yeah, this is just an example. Let me give you something that's perhaps a little more serious, namely uh, definitions of culture in German, English and French. Right, let's start with a German dictionary definition of Kultur, which is die Gesamtheit der geistigen und künstlerischen Errungenschaften einer Gesellschaft, the sum total of the intellectual and artistic achievements of a society. Yeah, well, that's that's culture, the stuff that you find in a museum. Um, let's look at English Anglo-Saxon definition of culture, which is the cultivation, the state of being cultivated, refinement, the result of cultivation, a type of civilization. So, uh, in a way, you can you can see here the contrast between the German thinkers and poets, and the Anglo-Saxon colonial masters who invented the steam engine and, and did stuff like that. Right. Let's add another level of complexity by adding uh, culture, um, which is uh, the ensemble des moyens mis en œuvre par l'homme pour augmenter ses connaissances, développer, améliorer les facultés de son esprit notamment le jugement et le goût. Okay, so fine judgment and taste and the faculties of the spirit. Uh, that also is culture. Um, and I find it really funny how national stereotypes that are really cliche show up in dictionary definitions of uh, culture if you look for them. Yeah. Um, now the, the idea that um, a society's habits of thought are in some way crystallized in their words, in their language. That is a very popular one, uh, and it's an idea that has been expressed over and over 
in the history of ideas. Let me give you a few examples, starting with uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, who said that uh, der Genius eines Volks offenbart sich nirgends besser als in der Physiognomie seiner Rede. The genius of a people shows itself like nowhere else in the physiognomy of its speech. Okay, um, second example, uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, he said, we may study the character of a people by the ideas which its language best expresses. French, for instance, contains such words as uh, spirituel or uh, l'esprit, which in English can scarcely be expressed at all. Whence we naturally draw the inference, which may be confirmed by actual observation, that the French have more esprit and are more spirituel than the English. Yeah, well, I guess you could disagree with that, but nonetheless. Um, <clears throat> another example, uh, Benjamin Lee Whorf. We'll hear more about Benjamin Lee Whorf in just a minute. Uh, he said, after long and careful analysis, the Hopi language is seen to contain no words, grammatical forms, constructions, or expressions that refer directly to what we call time. I find it gratuitous to assume that a Hopi who knows only the Hopi language and the cultural ideas of his own society has the same notions, often supposed to be intuitions, of time and space that we have and that are generally assumed to be universal. Okay, so here's Benjamin Lee Whorf telling us that the Hopi have no idea what uh, no, time really means. Uh, it's empirically wrong. I'll say more about that in just a few minutes, but I wanted to give you this quote here. Right, moving on with something more recent. Uh, here's a picture of Dan Sloban, um, well-known typologist and, and child language researcher. And he sort of expresses uh, an idea that represents the modern consensus of this idea. So he says, each native language has trained its speakers to pay different kinds of attention to events and experiences when talking about them. This training is carried out in childhood and is exceptionally resistant to restructuring in adult second language acquisition. And this idea he calls thinking for speaking. So if you come across the term thinking for speaking, that's Dan Sloban. Right. Um, now, you're waiting probably for me to uh, say, yeah, it's, you know, this is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The idea is most well known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And uh, Whorf, who we saw just a minute ago, is the Whorf of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. He was a student of Edward Sapir, who in turn was a student of Franz Boas, uh, who was one of the founders of structural linguistics in the United States, and he was also a central figure in the development of anthropology as an academic discipline. Okay, so what, what these uh, gentlemen here were mostly concerned with was the description of all the native North American languages, um, which were then at, at that time they were unexplored, right? Um, and uh, to their surprise, um, they found that these languages were much more complex and much more alien than anything else that linguists had seen up to that point. It was really a revelation that languages could be like that. Yeah? And this otherness, they were so excited by that that this led to a substantial shift in linguistic thought. Yeah? Up to that point, uh, Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin, the classical languages, were really seen as the model to you know, what a language should aspire to. They were the superior models of what grammar ought to look like. And um, the structures and grammatical categories of uh, the, the Native American languages simply looked very, very different, so that the categories of Greek and Latin were completely useless for the description of languages such as Navajo or Kuchin. Yeah? And the conclusion was that the structure of these Native American languages should be studied on its own terms. Okay, so uh, that's how the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis came about. First, the observation that everything, you know, the, the, the Native American languages were a lot more complicated than what people had assumed. Things are not as universal as we had believed. And um, that uh, gave rise to two 
different ideas that form part of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Let me first uh, present the, the, the first of these, uh, which is probably relatively uncontroversial. So what it states is that if there are structural differences between two languages, then there are also differences in the habits of thought that their respective speakers have. Yeah? Um, just to give you an example here, imagine a language in which uh, there is a word for death penalty, um, which is ba, yeah? single open syllable. And the word for vacation, on the other hand, is something very complex and complicated that you can only express through a long and complicated sentence. Now, I'm asking you, in which society would you rather live? The one that has you know, the monosyllabic death penalty, um, or would you ha rather have it the other way around, that ba is uh, the word for vacation, and if you want to express what it means to put someone to death, you would have to talk for half a minute. I would know where I would want to live. Still, of course, uh, you have to wonder if there is a linguistic difference. What exactly is the resulting cognitive difference? Yeah? For instance, if a language has no word for future time, like Worf assumed of the Hopi language, uh, does that mean that the speakers don't bother thinking a lot about the future? Or, conversely, uh, does it mean that uh, the speakers are so accustomed to thinking about the future that they see it as part of the present situation? Yeah, they, they talk about it as though it were part of the present. Um, there is a study by the American economist Keith Chen, um, and, and he believes in the second hypothesis. Uh, let me show you an abstract of that study. Um, it's called The Effect of uh, Language on Economic Behavior, Evidence from Savings Rates, Health Behaviors, and Retirement Assets. And um, so he looks at languages, some of which have a grammatical future construction and others that don't have a grammatical future. And his result is that speakers from languages with grammatical futures, like, for instance, well, French has a grammatical future. Uh, here, speakers view the future as disconnected from the present. Yeah? The future is not right now. It will happen someday, but not right now, and it's probably going to be a long time before the future will happen. Um, so these speakers view the future as disconnected from the present, and hence they save less money, they eat less healthy food, and they tend to engage in risky and hedonistic patterns of behavior. Yeah, Let the good times roll. The future is not here yet. Um, and uh, you, you can think of this what you like, but uh, the stats hold up, the values for these variables correlate significantly. Now, of course, um, correlation and causation, you know, they're not quite the same thing. And um, maybe it also should inspire some doubts in you to hear that there's also a very significant correlation between the savings rates of speakers, how much money they put away, and the presence of front-rounded vowels like u and u. Yeah? For every u that people say, they save more for retirement. Um, U's count double, even. Yeah? If that sounds totally absurd to you, you know, I can't blame you, but um, I did a bit of Googling and there are actually people who try to make sense of this. Let me show you this. This is hilarious. Um, so, vowels are to blame for German grumpiness. Yeah? Rounded vowels have been interpreted as the symptom of a grumpy national character, <laughs> those grumpy Germans. And of course, people who are notoriously pessimistic, like the Germans, would be expected to save more money for the bad times that are ahead. Yeah, uh, it's only going to get worse. Might as well save a little money so it doesn't get too bad. Um, so rounded vowels and the absence of future constructions, German doesn't really have a good future, um, could be seen as having a common cause in the pessimistic German worldview. And, uh, you know, if you ask me, they're probably strengthening one another. Yeah, well, we can speculate a lot about this. But for now, let's go back to Sapir and Worf for a minute. I still owe you a description of the second point here. Uh, the second point is this. It's a bit more controversial. Uh, through the acquisition of one's native language, one also acquires a worldview 
which is not easily changed in later life. So this is, you know, uh, reminiscent of Dan Slobin's thinking for speaking. Um, if you acquire a language and there are certain structures in that language, you get used to that and you get into patterns of thought that you can't easily change later in life. Um, what, what this implies though here in the strong version of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is that linguistic forms are not just cognitive pathways from which you could stray and take a different route, but rather the strong version is that language is a prison of your thoughts. You cannot help but think in the terms of your language. And Worf endorses this idea by saying that uh, grammar is not merely an instrument for reproducing ideas, but rather it is itself the shaper of ideas, the program and guide for the individual's mental activity for his analysis of impressions. Yeah, uh, and in this radical, uh, phrased in this radical way, linguists have been fairly skeptical about this. Yeah? Uh, not least because Worf's conclusions have been mostly based on um, you know, his, his Hopi studies. They were really empirically sloppy, yeah? not substantiated by more thorough investigations. It turns out that the Hopi have a lot of words about time. It turns out that they can very well reason about time just as anybody else. So just because they don't have words for time uh, doesn't mean anything in the first place. So um, in order to prove that there is some kind of relation between language and thought, which is what interests us, uh, we need to identify two languages that differ with regard to some linguistic criteria, some structural linguistic criteria. And having a future construction, having no future construction, that's actually you know, the kind of thing that you would be looking for. Then, of course, you need to advance the hypothesis of how this linguistic difference translates into a difference in cognition. Um, pretty much like you know, uh, Chen's hypothesis that having a future time translates into um, different savings rates. Um, however, most uh, serious research here doesn't just work with, with correlational data, like getting people's savings rates, but rather it puts people into an experiment. And usually the experiment uh, asks people to engage in some kind of non-linguistic behavior. Yeah? Uh, linguistic tasks, if you give people linguistic tasks, they would be affected by the grammar of your language. However, if you give people a task that is non-linguistic, then if you find differences between these two groups, one explanation could be that, all right, it's the language that makes people uh, perform this task differently. Right, so this has been a lengthy introduction. Um, in, this, in the rest of this episode, I'll talk about uh, color. Uh, color perception, of course, is the same across humans. We all have the same neural apparatus, but the expression of color differs strongly across languages. Uh, the second episode, the next one, will be about, uh, well, not spoons, but rather the material of spoons. That's important here. And the third episode will be about space and orientation in space. But for today, for today, uh, you know, it's color that will occupy us. And uh, human beings perceive color as a continuum of shades, as you see on this slide. Yeah? However, our words for color are categorical. So somehow we impose discrete categories on this continuum of color. We cut up the continuum in different ways from language to language, and we call one part of the continuum this and another part that. So, for instance, uh, you as a speaker of English, um, you now we have green for one part of the continuum and blue for another part of the continuum and a border in between. Now, of course, some people may say, well, that's turquoise. Uh, that's really fancy. That's not a basic color term. Um, okay, so interestingly now, there are languages that have a word that includes both green and blue, something that we could call gru. Yeah, Gru. Gru languages are languages like Vietnamese, Yucatec Maya, or Lakota. Okay, now, if we assume some kind of version of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, do speakers of Vietnamese 
perceive shades of green and blue in a way that differs from us yeah and if so how could we show that <clears throat> uh, here's a picture of Paul Kay who has written a very co-written uh, a very important book about color and language and um, so one of the many cool ideas that were presented in that book is that in the world's languages there is a hierarchy to the way languages express color so if you know how many basic color terms there are in a language the hierarchy can tell you which colors the language distinguishes that's you know, that's a stunner really um, so what you can say on the basis of uh, KN Berlin's hierarchy is that if there are only three basic color terms in a language then those three are black uh, white and red yeah if you have uh, five color terms these five are um, black red white uh, green and yellow if you have six they're going to be white black red green yellow and blue and so on and so forth yeah? So, in other words, there are amazing universals across languages with regard to how people cut up the color continuum. Now, at first, this may sound like evidence against Sapir-Whorf, but um, you can actually show very nice Whorfian effects on the basis of uh, Berlin and Kay's data. So, again, let's look at the GRU spectrum again. Uh, let's take three colors. And uh, if you juxtapose these colors, you can make a so-called triplet test, okay? A triplet test, uh, in a nutshell, is you have three things, and you have to decide which two are the pair and which one is the odd man out, okay? Now, if you are like me, uh, you would say, okay, these two here are green, and this one here is blue. So these two are the pair, and that one is the odd man out. Yeah. <clears throat> that was probably trivial, so let's take something more difficult. Yeah. Here we have uh, these three colors. <clears throat> um, and uh, okay, I see actually two blues and one one green. Okay. And you probably do too. But again, you know, somebody might say, well, these here look greenish, and and that's a clear blue. So I'm going to group these together. But, you know, uh, most people are probably just going to be like you and me, yeah? picking these two and having that be the odd man out. Okay, if you do this kind of you know, triplet testing with lots of people, lots of triplets, and uh, you have one group of participants from a blue-green language and one group from a guru language, uh, then you can see some very interesting differences, okay? So all subjects see all triplets and decide which one is the odd man out. Yeah? So people get lots and lots of uh, trials and you are, well, you collect lots and lots of data. And then you'll see for each pair how often they are grouped together. You, so you get some pairs that are never separated, you know, it doesn't matter which other color occurs with them, they're never separated. Um, <clears throat> then uh, there are pairs that are sometimes separated and sometimes not, depending on what third tile is uh, presented with them. And there are uh, pairs that are always separated. So the third color was always more similar to one or the other. These two uh, down here, they never end up as the pair as opposed to you know, the odd man out. Right, now what interests us of course is the middle ground here, the, uh, the cases in which pairs are sometimes separated but not always. Um, how often these tiles were separated, that's something you can visualize in a distance matrix such as this one. So these two greens were never separated, these two were separated only very, very rarely, um, and well, <clears throat> these two here were separated 80% of the time. Um, these two here, they look more similar, so they were only separated 
10% of the time. All right, so what's crucial now is whether these weightings differ across blue-green languages and GRU languages. Specifically, uh, do blue-green speakers overestimate the difference between turquoise colors when there's a linguistic border between the two color shades? Let me, let me make this a little more explicit. So uh, let's take once more these three colors here. So you and I, we, we see a difference here between the second and the third one. We, we make a pair of these and uh, we have this be the odd man out. Um, now, objectively, the, the physically measurable difference between these tiles is exactly the same. If you look at you know, the physical wavelength of the color, um, so if your perception of likeness and differences is just based on the wavelength of light, uh, the distance between these tiles should be the same. Yeah? And uh, if you give this task to uh, speakers of a GRU language, like uh, Tarahumara, a Mexican language, this is exactly what happens. The likelihood of these two being separated is the exact same of these two being separated. However, for a group of English speakers, the results are different. Yeah? Um, the blue color is excluded much more frequently. So there is a difference in behavior between uh, blue-green languages like English uh, and Tarahumara languages that are Guru languages. And this is, you know, that, that's a Worfian effect. <clears throat> uh, let's take another uh, triplet here. Uh, here the physical differences are asymmetric. And the question is, can speakers perceive this? Yeah? Can people see that between these two there's quite a bit of uh, wavelength difference? And between these, not so much of a wavelength difference. Okay, uh, Tarahumara speakers, they can do this. Yeah? They see that here there is a large difference, a larger difference, and between these there is a smaller difference. But for English speakers, no, the difference between these two is still larger because there is a, lang there's a language border between them. Yeah? That's, um, these two are called green, and this one is called blue, and that's why people in English imagine that the difference between these two is really larger than it actually is. Okay, so if the differences between two and three is across a linguistic boundary, speakers overestimate that difference. So this, of course, suggests a Worfian effect. Yeah? Speakers of different languages perform differently in a non-linguistic task, like picking tiles of color. Um, why do speakers behave in this way? No? A possible explanation is that they solve this task by resorting to language even if they don't have to. Yeah? So even though they don't have to use language when they do this, uh, they still do use language um, you know, by saying to themselves, okay, which color should I exclude? Well, in my language, uh, there's a word green and a word blue, and these tiles match green and blue, and in certain ways. So this is something that you, you could call a labeling strategy. And the labeling strategy evidently is, is only available to English speakers. The Tarahumara can't use it because they don't have a label to distinguish between green and blue. They just have GRU. Okay, now in a second experiment, um, uh, Kay and colleagues try to analyze whether it's actually this what's going on. So here again we have a triplet task. Um, but this time it was only done with English speakers and what's different this time is that only two colors are visible and the participants receive special instructions. They are told to judge the relative blueness and relative greenness of the colors. So uh, the, the first one here is very green, no? uh, not a whole lot of blueness going on, and the second one a little more of uh, blueness and also a whole lot of greenness. But the, the crucial thing about this experiment is that the frame here is movable. So there's a third tile and you can move it back and forth, but you can only ever see two tiles at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, speakers have to tell 
what difference is larger, the, the difference between 2 and 3 in terms of greenness and blueness, or uh, you know, the difference between 1 and 2 in terms of greenness. Yeah, you can switch back and forth and decide in the end. Okay, um, here, and that's the clever thing, uh, the labeling strategy no longer works because the middle color is both relatively green and relatively blue. Right, what are the results of this? Um, remember from the first experiment here speakers overestimated differences between uh, tiles when the differences were across a color term boundary. And uh, in the second experiment the results are actually closer to the physical realities of what the wavelength of light uh, is like. And um, nicely enough there is no statistical difference between uh, the English participants of experiment 2 and the Tarahumara from the first experiment. So uh, the, the good news about this is that your color perception as a speaker of English it's not damaged, okay? You don't have sustained uh, permanent damage from learning English, just a heavy degree of distortion through, you know, getting into the habit of calling things uh, green and blue. So, um, of course, now that this is a hot topic and uh, some people were actually not convinced by this, uh, because if the cause is the labeling strategy, uh, this would mean that language does not usually influence thought. Only if normal thought runs into difficulties, then uh, speakers use language sort of as a crutch, um, which can then have some kind of effect. And Steve Pinker um, expresses this uh, worry. Now, he doesn't believe in uh, you know much. Of, he, he doesn't believe in the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, period. So what he says is this. Now, how on earth does this guy expect me to pick two chips to put together? He didn't give me any hints, and they're all pretty similar. Well, I'd probably call these two green and that one blue, and that seems as good a reason to put them together as any. Okay, so does this mean that all of Kay's work was just a false alarm? Well, there is research suggesting that it actually was no false alarm, and for that we have to move from green to blue. So here's a blue color continuum. All of these colors are actually called blue um, in English, but in Russian there is an interesting distinction uh, between, okay, I'm pronouncing this horribly, Goluboy and Sini. Yeah? There's no overarching blue in Russian that would account for the whole spectrum, just like there is no Gru in English. Um, now, the uh, psychologist Lara Boroditsky has devised a test in which language is not usable as a help for the task here. <clears throat> it's again a triplet task, <clears throat> and the participants had to decide as fast as possible which of the lower colors was identical with the upper one. You know, I don't know how big your screen is. If you're watching this on a smartphone, you're probably out of luck. But, uh, okay, you're supposed to look at these two and uh, match one of these with the one on top. Okay? And these two, they look the same. This one here is a wee bit lighter. Right, so the participants had to decide as fast as possible which of the lower colors was identical with the upper one. And the trick with this experiment is that for Russian speakers, there may be two conditions. <clears throat> um, there may be a cross category uh, tradition, um, tradition, uh, a cross-category condition in which, you know, uh, the two stimuli are from different categories, one from Sini and one from Godoboy, and there uh, is also a within-category condition where both tiles uh, below are from the same category, which supposedly would be, you know, a lot harder so the hypothesis is that Russians would be slower to react in the within category condition that you see here uh, than in the cross category condition because there, you know, language actually helps them to see a difference, and in the within category condition, uh, language doesn't help. Um, for the English, of course, all colors are blue, so for them there should not be a difference across these two 
uh, conditions because they, they don't know uh, the, the different labels for light blue and dark blue. Okay, now what came up? Um, there is an effect in the expected direction. So when the two colors are from the same linguistic category, then the Russians are slower. So you see here the white bar, uh, slower reaction times for the within category condition. Um, the English are generally faster. Don't ask me why, but you know, these things can happen. The crucial thing is that uh, the latencies across the two conditions don't differ significantly. Yeah, they're, they're the same. So um, now you see here the time it takes the Russians and the uh, English. It's just around the thousand millisecond mark. So that is too short for a linguistic naming strategy. Yeah, in K's experiment, people had like seconds to decide and make up their mind. Here, uh, things have to be done very, very quickly. Right, uh, but still you could come back and say, ah, how can you be sure it's language that influences how people do this experiment? Well, uh, Boroditsky shows that it's the language by running a similar version of the experiment in which language is actually used as a distraction so that participants do the experiment while they are doing something with language, like counting backwards. Okay, so in a way you take language out of the game um, so that you know you already your brain already uses language for one thing, it can't use it, it can't use it for, for a different kind of uh, reasoning. <clears throat> And uh, so if you give the experiment to Russians and you have them count backwards at the same time, then spectacularly the effect disappears, okay? Reaction times are even a little bit longer because, well, it's more difficult. Um, but crucially, there's no longer this difference between the two conditions. This means it is the linguistic competence that drives the Worfian effect. Um, could it be just, just any cognitive difficulty destroys the effect. Um, a third experiment, a third variant of the experiment involves a task where uh, people have to do some kind of geometric task. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> and uh, this is the, the middle columns here. So the distractor task slows down the performance, but the Worfian effect uh, with the Russians stays the same. Yeah, so you see these bars, they look exactly like the first set of bars. Uh, in the English, you see that, okay, the distractor task messes with the participants. They are a bit slower, but still uh, no difference between the conditions. So, uh, things are looking quite good for the sapir whorf hypothesis. Um, in the next episode, we'll talk about um, spoons, yeah? Um, and I hopefully see you there. <laughs>